All right. Well, hello, 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 and welcome to Intercultural Spark, that show about the spark inside you that drives you to spark change in the world through mission-driven businesses and life projects. Welcome, my friends, to Intercultural Spark. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome uh, to Intercultural Spark. Each week we talk to entrepreneurs, sometimes micro entrepreneurs. So businesses, maybe less than 10 employees. But I have this firm belief that micro entrepreneurs are going to save the world because these are people who are running businesses, doing fascinating values based work, you know, really doing things to change the world. But they're running businesses. So, you know, supporting families and kids going to college and all of that. And with so much focus, you know, about what big businesses are doing, people sometimes forget that there's this whole, you know, world of small business owners who are actually doing things in their own right to change the world. Our guest today is one of those people. His name is Gabor Holch. I was so delighted to meet Gabor at um, CETAR, big conference in uh, Malta uh, two months ago now. So Gabor is, he's like the epitome of what it means to be intercultural, just having grown up in Hungary and then living in the Middle East. And now he's uh, living in China. So he is the king of being able to adapt and move through cultures and through his consultancy, he helps other businesses know how to do that to be more effective. So as we do every week, we are going to start before we bring Gabber on with our flash exercise. So each week uh, being also, actually, I love this. I think I like the drama of the, of the strip. I'm also not just a business person, but an aerobics instructor. And so each week we do an exercise that is indicative of the theme of our show. I invite you to do this exercise with me. And at the end, we'll let Gabber guess, we'll let him try it. And also guess why we picked this show or this exercise for the show. So this is a core strength exercise. So I want you to sit in the chair at your desk. You can come to the edge of your chair. Arms are up overhead. The arm movement is a circle around. Your knees come off the ground. So you're going to circle around and bring your knees up. So it's a core strength exercise. If you try that in your chair, which actually I'm going to invite Gabber now. Gabor, try this with me. So arms up. Hello, everybody. Yeah, Hi. sure, sure. Right? And then Happy bring to. your knees up. So you're going to see yeah. it's a really strong. So it starts It starts with this. No, it actually starts with the arms overhead. It starts with this. Yep. Short, and then I'm wearing shorts because it's, it's ridiculously hot here. Oh, uh, we'll just do one of them. Circle so, the arms around and then bring your knees to your chest. Yeah, something like this. Yes, that's it. Oh, and you're wearing back. shorts. It's okay. Wait, I've got my... Thank you. I've got my exercise clothes on as well. Nobody can see. Pretend like you didn't see Gabber's shorts <laughs> or my bare legs. Right, you couldn't wait, see the shorts wait, for sure. I'm putting my suit back on. This is this is serious business stuff. It is, yes. <laughs> From the waist up. From the waist up. So we'll let you guess at the end of the show, uh, Gabber, why we chose that for this show. I'm going to start with, because we just talk. So sometimes I take creative license when... I am setting up shows and I put a subtitle of when bosses are arses. I thought it was kind of fun because it it um, rhymed. And it came from the idea, Gabor, that you had mentioned that you always knew you had to be your own boss because you had trouble working for other people. That's right. But then I was like, do you like my title? He was like, actually, no, I don't. Why not? <laughs> yes, the first greetings to everybody. Thank you for being with us. And thank you, Diana, for having me on the show again. Last time it was indeed Malta, and uh, I wish we were there right now, especially in this yes, heat and you were near the sea. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, there are a couple of reasons um, why I didn't like it, but, but um, the basically my main problem was the verb uh, when bosses are asses, because that means that we are basically labeling somebody. We are, we are, we are kind of. Uh, giving them being an ass okay. as a as a trait. When we do that, when we when we use that kind of label, then we basically take away the agency of the person to to change it. That Whereas so if we say somebody is 
you know, it's a little bit like you are an ass or you are being an ass. Right. You know, and that there comes a up a lot there. with you are a racist or you're acting racist. Exactly. What's fascinating, which you know, if you as soon as you say, oh, you're a racist, that sort of stops conversation. But um, it's also fascinating, Gabor, how many languages do you speak? Because now I'm thinking of if I had written that in Spanish, I would have used a star instead of ser because yes, the star exactly. would have given us the, the lack of permanency. Yes, I love that, yeah, that's that right. level of, um, I, I love, I thought you had a problem with the word arses. You had a problem with the word are. No, no, I, I think, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically when, uh, the, let's it. not, let's not be afraid of, of, of labeling anybody, um, anybody's behavior as an arse behavior. That is not a problem because we cannot deny that kind of impulse in either the person who acts or the or the person who witnesses the action. Basically, when we say that, then it's amygdala to amygdala, right? So somebody somebody made a poor choice of words or a poor, poor choice of action, and then the other person basically reacts to it accordingly. And then then mm -hmm. we can we can label somebody, as you said, somebody like racist, rude, arrogant. Uh, but also there is the kind of more passive aggressive, like uh, I can I can uh, label you weak or I can label you inactive. But then the, the very important thing is to remember that what we see is behavior and not characteristic because the characteristic mm -hmm. is not something that we see. And that's, that was the only reason why I didn't like uh, that title because especially with bosses, especially with bosses, it helps us an awful lot to remember that they are human beings and that arseness that, that really bugs us right now that could be changed with the right impulse. Uh, sure. You know, what I find, uh, you just sort of, because I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about what you do with your business, but you also summed up a lot of just the, the when you look at intercultural connections, there are, that was such a level of, um, that was such a level of detail that has so much impact on meaning and connection in terms right. of how you looked at that. It's fascinating to me. How does that play out? Just tell us your, your consulting business. You obviously work with companies around the globe with different cultures. How do you work with companies then to help them come to, I guess, working more effectively as teams or understanding across cultures? One thing that will help everybody understand a little bit uh, mm -hmm. about what I do and how I do it is that very early in my career, I started being connected to high power individuals. So uh, I, I started uh, studying all kinds of social sciences. Then I ended up studying diplomacy and I became a junior diplomat for a, for a security organization. So uh, from the very time that I was an intern, I I was working with ministers, the kind of people who are like, uh, I was I was an intern in the UN uh, terrorism prevention unit. So oh, wow. um, th the stakes were very high and people were people were very, very, very sure of, of, of the importance of the work they do. And I connected them very well with them. So this is one thing that I noticed that I was not afraid of authority. I was I was cheeky. I was irreverent and they loved it. Absolutely mm -hmm. loved it. So even now, I, I basically work with, with the top management of uh, mostly Western multinationals that do business with East Asia. But okay. we have to remember that not all of these people are Western executives working with East Asia because these uh, organizations, they promote local people into management and then to leadership. So it could happen to be an Indian, Chinese or a Filipino person who becomes a, um, a high level executive in a German or an Italian or an American company. Mm -hmm. And one thing that you have to know, about, and it's, it's, it's very strange because it's a little bit like coaching people or advising people or training people of, of that kind of authority in an organization is a little bit like a nurse trying to give medicine that the patient doesn't want to take. And you have to be very, very diplomatic about, about how you give it. And perhaps that's why I have this gut instinct of for example, correcting the thing that you said. Oh, don't, because don't how you deliver it, that could stop conversation. That's the problem. If you yes, deliver, it does. that is so hard. You know, that whole idea where it's like intent does not equal impact. You can, there is a surefire way to stop conversation, which is to use the wrong word. Before you started it. Yeah, before you started it. You, you ended before you started it. Yeah. What I find interesting about what you're talking about, so it's multinational companies, but let's say when you're working with them, you could have five people of all different cultural backgrounds that you're trying to to pull together. So is it a lot of 
So, you know, there's group training when people right. look at intercultural, there's often groups, but are you doing more individual coaching then for how they can come together? It's kind of seasonal. It, uh, tr the training has its season. So usually when, when companies are closing their financial year, they don't want to do training. When they are just preparing for Christmas, they don't want to do training. So um, then it's mostly coaching and also advising. So you have to imagine I also, let's say, look at a company's uh, performance management system. I look at their competency system, their core value system, and we basically mentally model or even look at the, the, the track record of, of using the system that was created in one culture in another culture. Oh, now, when we say that, we automatically think it's geographic cultures here. And it does happen that a, a German company created a competency system or a performance management system. They started using it in Japan and Korea absolute disaster. Just people just didn't respond to it the way they did in the West. But you also have to remember that that nationality and geography is just one element of culture. So it could happen that one of these systems doesn't work across sectors. For example, there was an, uh, there was an mm -hmm. automotive company or a machinery company, but now mostly they provide the software that runs the machines mm -hmm. and not the machines themselves. You changed cultures. If you look at maybe the system doesn't work across generations, mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't work across gender mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. You know where else that plays out a lot? Lots of times you'll get called in, let's say for a diversity project for companies. It turns out that mm -hmm. the disconnect is between like between like sales and a administration. That well, it's I mean, yeah. different sections. <laughs> it does that. happen, although although they should have thought of that earlier. So you know, if you have like a performance management system that mm -hmm. doesn't work between sales and management, mm -hmm. but it does happen. It does well, happen because, because so many companies merge. Yeah, but you know, you yeah. ideally they would have solved it. But then there's so many mergers, and then when two companies come together, you have two completely different. Cultures. Oh, let me let me tell you one of my favorite stories. So it happens a lot that there is a Western multinational, or if not Western, then sometimes Japanese multinational mm -hmm. company. And then they go to uh, they go to East Asia, Southeast Asia, India, um, also a, a prime uh, acquisition target. And there are there are lots and lots of extremely talented small tech companies where a bunch of let's a couple of dozen of very smart people come together. They develop some kind of technology solution, and then a big bank or a big automotive company or another multinational company snaps them up, basically acquiring the solution. Now the conversations that ensue almost immediately are absolutely fascinating. Because they say, well, congratulations, you know, now your little startup is part of this big global family and you should be very proud of that. And then immediately they give people things that they don't like. You know, uh, those people who have been very successful in a tech startup, they don't like to wear something around their neck and have their magnetic cards uh, that tells them where well, they, they can don't like, they go. They don't like having bosses. No, <laughs> they don't like having bosses. Right? They don't like uh, having suits around them. Right. They don't like all of that, the sterile environment, you know, and so sure. not being able to take that dog to work. Now, then, then what happens is that uh, obviously this in a large organization becomes something like a discipline issue uh, eventually. You are supposed to follow the protocol. And then they go over to the tech people and they say, you know, now you're in this multinational company, you have to become like it. You have to fit in. Mm -hmm. And then the, the young innovators, they say, no, I think we are here because you have to become more like us. Right. You're the ones who thought we were cool and, want, exactly. and wanted to be one of So you are the dinosaurs yeah. that we injected with a little bit of uh, angel <laughs> blood, or I don't know what it is. So, um, this, these uh, conversations can be absolutely fascinating. The same thing about, let's say, Europe, the old continent with the traditions, with the, with the heritage, and Asia with the dynamism, uh, with, the, with the huge markets. And basically, as Mackenzie said, the future is Asian. So uh, very similar dialogues there. Mm -hmm. So you know, what I find really interesting, what you're talking about. So everything we're talking about is really looking at these amazing business applications for intercultural connections, understanding different cultures. You know, I always like to say when I talk to people, it's like, I'm not just, you know, I don't just play an interculturalist on TV. I live it too. You know, in yeah, my right. case, I, my husband is, is Brazilian, is from Brazil. We're, so we're interfaith, intercultural, uh, you know, everything we do, we have a teenager in the house. So we're like getting practice on that stuff all the time. Yeah. But as for you, so you're, so tell me just a little bit, like, where does your personal and business intersection? Because I know you live in China. I think, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because you're part of an inner 
cultural family as well. Yeah, I mean, there is uh, there is this thing that I sometimes do in my keynotes. You know, um, an Irishman, an Englishman, a German, a Japanese, and a Chinese walk into a meeting room. That's not a joke. That's my job. <laughs> That's very uh, funny. And it, 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 it does happen. So, so uh, basically, I, I started myself on that, on that junior diplomatic career that I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. And then that was, that was basically the, the end of our last conversation and the beginning of this one. Because um, I, was, I was supposed to be on the right track to go higher in that security organization. Mm -hmm. And I left. I literally left against any, everybody's will. My boss really tried, tried to hold me back. And the only reason that, that uh, you kind of liked that I gave you is that I really didn't want to have a boss. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just didn't do well with that. As I said to you, I mean, uh, not, not respecting authority too much. That was an advantage in certain situations because mm -hmm. it gave me confidence when I was something like 28 and I was talking to D1 level United Nations diplomats, which is, a, which is very high. But eventually I just realized that when somebody says, oh, Gabo, that's a fantastic idea, within three years it can become a project. You know, it's that, that's simply not for my attention span. So um, I left and, and by that time I had a lot of interests which were connected to East Asia. And then I went on the map and I, I basically looked up where stuff happened at the moment. Uh, this was in 2002. So I went over to China to something that I thought was a sabbatical for two years to learn the language and learn martial arts because this this is one of my passions and i thought that's what i would do for two years yeah please anytime <laughs> stop me because i like talking so <laughs> don't wait for me to breathe oh no i was thinking the martial arts so oh, okay okay yeah, i no, thought I that was like a time out oh no <laughs> yeah then no that's that no, wait, that's would that be yeah. very american that would be yeah your time yeah up. that's right Oh, that's no, yeah, yeah. I, I had I had been studying martial arts for a long time by then, and then I I was thinking, okay, where are let's let's see all those all those old kung fu families, what what they can do. I mean, they are, yeah, they uh, they can really kick, as the song says. But anyway, so I was there. I was doing odds and ends. I was I was a visiting lecturer at a, at an international uh, university. I I did some coaching uh, freelance. Then that was that was. Um, uh, a management consultant who did investment projects and I was the intercultural guy. Um, and basically he was, yeah, he was, he was the one who drew my attention to this profession, management consulting, because it was mm -hmm. not really in the zeitgeist um, in the part of Europe where I was usually working. Mm -hmm. Then um, one thing followed another. And then um, with a Chinese friend of mine that I met through work, uh, we started our own consultants in 2007. Uh, sorry, no, 2005, and in 2008, I took it over, and then ever since then, uh, what we call company management consulting is basically the basis of my of my consulting work, although, as you also mentioned in your announcement, about half of my portfolio is my own Shanghai-based firm, mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong slash Shanghai-based firm, and my other half portfolio is that uh, fortunately, lots of consultancies all over the world need somebody with my profile. Oh, so basically, I love it. so they'll actually find find you and connect. Yes, it's it's either the either the either the Chinese language because I also deliver projects in uh, in Mandarin, or because they want somebody like a bridge person, or sometimes it's really just the founder of the company or their senior consultants that really really don't want to fly twelve hours. So then um, I deliver on their behalf. She'll do the flying. So let's right. talk a little bit deeper into, um, and no, I'm just fascinated because the more I learn about you, because the management consulting always strikes me as something that's like so very serious. And so the more I learn about you, not only are, are you, you're a funny guy, but also, um, you know, the experience too, is you're also sort of all in because we met a couple of times at the conference in Malta and it was like people saying, Hey, let's go to dinner. And it was like, okay, Hey, let's do this. And you were like, okay. So there was very much a, like, I'm all in to experience this. And yeah, that's right. The kickboxing I'm and either all in or all out. There is no middle way yeah. for me. Um, so, so speaking of all in, sometimes people, and this show talks to a lot of people like that. There's a very personal sort of values driven reason that people do this and right. the conference the conference was about you know does interculturalism work because we're talking about all the hatred growing in the world so there was that question like have have we done our job what right is your connection to 
I guess, the values behind doing intercultural training? You mean personally, myself? Yeah, yeah. I guess, what right. is your alignment between your business and your personal values? I don't know. I think, I think um, professionally, I mean, forget private life, although I think it, it, what I'm going to say also applies to private life. But professionally, the happy people are the ones when, who, who find a kind of activity where suddenly you tell yourself, you're serious? They are going to pay me for this? Because, because you're basically playing. You know, Friedrich Nietzsche said that, that uh, somebody uh, becomes a real adult when he can do anything as seriously as a child at play. So if you, if you suddenly realize that if you, if you jump over this kind of bar and then you can win championships and you can make a good living or you can make somebody beautiful and you can make a living, then you're a happy person because you're not going to feel like you're working. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is basically me. So um, I, was, I was four years old when my, my parents, uh, my father was working in the Middle East. They took me over there. I started making this kind of, the kind of observations that, that a four-year-old would make in another culture. So, you know, uh, the previous four years, I, I, was, I was very busy learning how the world works. And then one of the things that they teach you when you live in, in Europe as a kid is that men wear a, wear a suit and trousers and women, women wear a frock or a dress of some sort. Then you go over to Baghdad, Iraq, where I spent a fair amount of my childhood. And then men walk around in, in, in something that I consider, I mean, now I know it was a galabia. But at that time, oh, interesting. It looked like a dress. as a four-year-old uh, European Hungarian kid, to me, it was a dress. Mm -hmm. So then you ask your parents, what is happening here? And then they say, well, in this place, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I never stopped oh, after that marveling these kind of, number one, the differences themselves, mm -hmm. but number two, how easily we switch, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is one thing. But the other thing is that I think we are, we are living in a world, and especially, I mean, maybe our generation, my, uh, my, my daughter is 21. Okay. She doesn't know about the transition. She was just born into the world where everybody is interdisciplinary in a way, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you cannot be an, uh, an IT person today. If you're IT, you're also customer service. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a chef. If you're a chef, you're also doing marketing. It, there is no other way now. Sure. So you have to find the best combination. And I think we are the kind of people who, who found the best combination. That basically, uh, for a brief interval, I was a teacher. So I was wondering, this is an amazing job, but it pays rubbish, basically. Mm -hmm. So how could you be a teacher and also be well paid? Then I forgot about the whole thing. And years afterwards, I was, I was doing uh, um, corporate training. I found myself doing corporate training. Everybody in the room is a VP and a CEO and a CFO. And you're basically teaching them. And then suddenly it's like, ah, oh, I'm a teacher and then I get good money for it. And these moments are extremely important because once you find a couple of these moments, I don't think you need motivation anymore. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just becomes something that you really want to do. And suddenly they, somebody stops you from, uh, uh, stops, you, uh, stops paying for it. Mm -hmm. You will keep doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that, and because and, I do like to look at things that you do in your business that are transferable to other business owners. So a lot of my my viewers, like my network of people are mostly non-digital natives. So grew up without technology, but now just either with the economy or the great resignation, a lot of people are, are pursuing their own businesses. Mm -hmm. and what I find interesting, what you talk about is for our generation, it, sometimes it does feel like there's still that idea of, oh, this is what I do for work. This is what I do for fun. But you're right. That can't almost even exist anymore. Like there's no such thing as uh, personal and private anymore, I think, just given. It the, never did. You know, it, it never really did. I mean, let, let's if we can, let's try to talk to our grandparents generation. If you cannot mm -hmm. just read, read about that generation. I mean, you go back 100 years in time. And I think I think what it was about 100 years ago when life started dramatically changing you know it's uh if, you, if uh, that's when that's when people started having jobs rather than professions for example that's when they separated the weekend from the weekday in most countries so mm -hmm. uh if you go back a little bit further than that a musician didn't have a weekend a baker didn't have a weekend an accountant didn't have a weekend people were just doing they they tried to choose something that they like doing and then they just did it and then you know there is this there is this um uh repeating study why do you want to work for yourself and then people say i want to be my own master 
I want to work less and I want to make more money. And then they find out, then you start working for yourself <laughs> and then you are your own master. You are not going to work more less. Right. And you're not necessarily making more money, but overall your well-being goes up. And, and okay. that's because, sure. you know, when I was in the UN, when somebody, I, I, I saw this as a young man at that time, mm -hmm. when I was in the UN, when somebody got, there was an open door policy all over the UN building in Vienna. When somebody got a new office, obviously they didn't close the door, but the first thing that they did when they got a new office, they usually put the desk so that they face the window. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that they did, everybody is to turn it around so that you cannot see what they are doing with their screens, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> because because half of the time when people now in, are in the office, they are not working. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what they were doing, but they didn't want anybody else to see it. So this is that stops. This is the thing that stops when you start working for yourself. Yeah. Uh, to resonate on, on two points that you made. Yeah, please. Um, and I think that's universal, whatever business. So if you want to open a shoemaker business, you're a dentist and you want to uh, open a clinic. If you are an accountant or if you are if you are something somebody like extremely high level consulting i mean you're the only person who knows how to create a kind of strategic plan first of all i'm 51 especially to our generation and also perhaps generation is uh, just before us mm -hmm. be calm computer literate i don't think there is an there is an excuse for our generation anymore because you are not driving a, an old Ford with a stick anymore uh, on the internet. You're driving a brand new car with an automatic gear shift and and all the beeps and all the all the reminders. So you know, uh, young people who create these applications online, they make it so idiot proof. That is true. So for people who maybe tried technology earlier, some stuff is you know, so much yes. easier now. They, 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 they create these kind of drag and drop things and the things that yeah. we are, you know, the software that we are using that I, I have a microphone here, the, the, the software that this microphone uses, they make it so easy that a six year old could use it. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they do. Because yeah. that's when that's when kids start. So I, I, would, I would say, you don't know how to set up a podcast. You don't know how to create cloud storage, things like this. <laughs> Just learn it. Either learn or <clears throat> or you hire someone or, you know, hire someone who can help yeah. you. Mm, okay. Um, let, me, let, let, let me bring this to the second point that I wanted to make. Okay. I meet uh, executives. I meet investors, entrepreneurs, all these kind of things, uh, all these kind of people. Absolutely brilliant. Some of them verge on the genius. Some of them are veritable geniuses. And then I have to talk to them, listen, if you're a genius, it doesn't matter unless the world knows about it. And what is vanishing from around us is the institution that you can join. And then it's the institution's job to let the world know that you're a genius. But this kind of, this kind of proposition is vanishing from us. And if, especially during the lockdown, if you're the most brilliant code writer in the world, but nobody knows that you can write great code, What's going to happen to you? So especially if you want to work for yourself, there is your expertise and there is the connection with the market. Yeah. If you imagine it like a channel. Wait, now I am doing. <laughs> yes. Feel oh, free to. For two things. That was, that was, no, that was my Kung Fu again. Only because believe it or not, we're actually out of time and I, I don't want to hesitate. Well, uh -oh. actually for two things. One is right. I got to tell you, my approach to working with small business is always very empowering. So just my whole orientation, particularly working with older business owners, I will never tell you like, unless you do this, you're not going to make it. I'll tell you, you need to get the word out there. But I think there's different roads to get there. Right. And so I would say that and and a lot of business owners to scale, you know, it's kind of like, what are the things that you're good at? What are the things that you can delegate? So I think there's different roads for for people to get to that success. Yes. And good at and success, like. Good at and like. I think both important. Uh, speaking of success. Uh, what is next for you? Because I understand that you have a new book, like your third book coming out. So tell me. Yeah. About your book well i mean it's yes exactly um we are on 21st i have a first of august deadline for dragon suit which is um the subtitle is the golden age of expatriate ex, uh, executives in china it is it is a kind it, it's about two dozen interviews with with high-powered executives and their coaches and their doctors what is it, the golden age of what uh expatriate executives in china 
And uh, you can very easily find it. You just type in uh, dragonsuit.info. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. That will also take you to my, um, to my blog uh, that you already know, Diana. And um, I yes, think, so. yeah, I mean, I mean, let's do holtz.biz. So you'll include information here. So this is everything. Well, actually, what is going to happen if you type in dragonsuit.info is just easier to remember the book. It will take you to the to the uh, specific page of this page. OK. All right. Gabber, um, one of the this is a one word answer. What technology do you use to help run your business? Like, is there any oh, there technology? Is, are you no, there is, there is no, there is no one word answer for that. It's like, what tool do you use to tend your garden? It's um, the best tool for everything, but just, uh, okay, let, let's put it this way. I use Google. Whatever you want to do, uh, type in Google, the best tool to, <laughs> you know, oh, edit gotcha. your video. <laughs> but amazing. do you use any sort amazing. of management, project management software? I use a CRM. I, I can recommend to everybody, uh, buy a good CRM, something like, 10 bucks a, a month, uh, keep all your client data there, keep all your Which appointments you there. Mind sharing? I, I use uh, Zoho. I use Zoho. Okay. Oh, because uh, two weeks ago we had a guest on, they were talking about monday.com, always looking in. Project management software has gotten to a point where it's much more. Yeah, helpful. this is Sierra. So this is customer relations management. So it, it, is, a, it is a more entry level software than uh, project management software. Fantastic. All right, Gabber, let's do our exercise again. So yeah, that's right. Now get to guess. I'm going to let you, I'm going to have you show us. Same one. Show us, yep. Show us the exercise. So arms okay. up overhead. So what do you do? Arms up arms overhead. Up and now come and, and then around and you pull your up knees. your knees. Yes, that's and it. Okay. That is it. Fantastic. All right. So you know, it looks like a little bit like that character. You, you uh, pull the string and it goes like this. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> and how would that relate to your business? How would that relate no, to you? <laughs> All right. So the reason that I chose that exercise for you is that it's like the idea of because of being intercultural, you're like gathering together, you know, ideas and things from around the globe, pulling it all together. And then because it's a really good core exercise, you're taking everything from around the globe, pulling it together to make companies and your clients stronger. Yeah. And also what you do, I mean, if if you know the Chinese art of Qigong, you oh, always okay. collect like you, you collect the energy to um, basically halfway between your navel and your naughty bit that in, 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 in Taoist philosophy, that's the the uh, the energy core of the body. Oh, well, fantastic. That, yeah, that's why I did that too. <laughs> Gabber, it was so wonderful to connect with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Just an Thank you for having great. me. So you are It was great chatting time, with you again. I feel like every time we peel away a layer, there's so much more. So I know there's so much more. Yeah, because we are experts, you. you know, we we explore. Uh, we don't <laughs> we don't have structure. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't leave me, but everyone else, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching Intercultural Spark. We'll see Thank you next week. Thank you, everybody. Bye.